Hello and welcome to Differential Discussions. I'm Melissa. And I'm Dave. And today we're actually going to start our first theory podcast. And we're going to start the theory podcast by discussing hemostasis. I'm pretty excited and quite nervous. Anytime we like <laughs> to talk about coag or, th- or hemostasis, it's a good day. Yeah, right. Yeah. So um, it's been probably hard for the audience to pick this up, right? Because of our content is so morphological uh you know it's 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 in the scope but you're the coag person right like this is um probably the, I, the single area that you're most passionate about is that fair to say in hematology as a whole yeah i think coag is what got me interested in heme yeah because i didn't really care for heme itself in the beginning now i like heme but yeah. in the beginning i was like i like chemistry because i like complex biochemical pathways and mm-hmm. coag is basically a bridge between heme and chem and blood bank because it's all about complex biochemical pathways so i love coag and all of hemostasis Mm -hmm. and i still love hemostasis (laughs) yeah i think hemostasis actually often gets kind of forgotten about with heme yeah it's the the cbc is always front of mind yeah 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 yeah. um so yeah this will this will be fun so uh i i i teach coag um and, uh, you know, I got my SH and all that fun stuff, that jazz. Um, there's going to be gaps, and we're going to see that Melissa is the clear uh, <laughs> theory person on this. But I, I, th- I think this will this will be fun. We've done a little bit of prep. I've done a tiny bit of prep, um, but we haven't done an extensive, exhaustive kind of combing over. But Like uh, most of our stuff, we're going to just kind of go for it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's just best when it's organic like that. Yeah, and hopefully that helps kind of humanize us a little bit more um you know uh but yeah so <clears throat> talking about hemostasis yeah um i i think the first thing that comes to mind is like primary secondary right uh hemostasis and, and tertiary so there, that's the first thing is that there's the three different parts to hemostasis primary yeah. secondary and tertiary so primary. obviously we're going to start at the beginning <laughs> right right yeah so the beginning of the story is primary but the beginning, beginning, right? So maybe this is the uh, the prologue or whatever is we're talking about the vasculature, yeah. which, um, yeah, so we'll spend a little bit of time uh, talking about uh, the vasculature. It's hard to have a primary plug without <laughs> a place to Something plug. To plug. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, geez. so let's just, let's start in the, what is the primary, secondary, and tertiary? Yeah, sure. That's, I guess that's fair. So Um, primary hemostasis, uh, defined by our, uh, platelet plug formation, right. And all the various stages that have a secure platelet plug. Um, I think that's my loose and dirty definition. Secondary would be, uh, the formation of, um, uh, fibrin strands. Right. And so that's our coag cascade, um, and then tertiary would be uh, getting rid of it, right? So our hem- <laughs> we form our plug, uh, the clot, right, is solidified, and then we want to get rid of the clot because we've healed. So um, obviously, you don't want to have a clot just stay indefinitely. <laughs> At some point, they got to go. We also don't want it to break off and go do something yeah. else. And embolize, we right? Yep. Get rid of it, break it down, remove all the pieces this way. It doesn't go cause problems very good yep yeah because of uh you left it there indefinitely it would certainly embolize right yep um yeah all right so let's just hop right into primary hemostasis and like dave said we're going to start with the vasculature so i think let's just start at the very beginning right the vasculature has three layers and the vascular intima is that inner layer that we know provides that surface for the blood to kind of roll along and move along so let's let's talk about that first layer and what's underneath it then dave sure sure uh so our first layer is our endothelial cell uh layer so uh endothelial cells have lots of different functions but i i try to always lead with its main job is to form a smooth contiguous surface for blood flow um if the blood flow is uh erratic or disturbed you can get clots and things uh forming so the first uh, first job first layer would be our endothelial cell uh membranes uh, endothelial cell layer 
I'm right. And I think that endothelial layer plays a lot of roles, not just in hemostasis, although we are going to focus. So it, it plays roles in the immune response, the vascular permeability, uh, the proliferation, and of course, hemostasis. So we're focusing on hemostasis here, obviously, but it does play a lot of different roles. And so the biggest role hemostatically, like Dave said, is that surface. Because if you have bumps, if you have things sticking out, you can cause cells to stick to it or if you have a hole in it things can leak out or other things underneath the endothelial cells can be exposed what's exposed under our endothelial cell <laughs> so the first thing i think of when an endothelial cell uh is disturbed right is collagen exposure um so a lot of the i think the, the one of the primary building blocks of vasculature itself is this collagen uh this connective tissue um, and collagen is going to play a really important role, role with our platelets and, uh, and things like that. A little foreshadowing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The other thing is the fibroblasts. So yes. fibroblasts underneath the endothelial cells, they <laughs> secrete something called tissue factor. And that's also going to play a big role later on. Yes. <clears throat> Extrinsic. <clears throat> <laughs> so cool. So, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, you know, there's probably, I'm sure that there's a vasculature nerd out there in the wild, right? That could probably uh, wax um, poetically forever about uh, vasculature and how awesome it is. But th those are the essential components when it comes to hemostasis, right? Yeah. And then, of course, well, let's let's talk about the properties of the vasculature because they do have properties that support coag. Uh, yes. That either um, they have on their surface or things that they release or things that they expose when they're damaged, which we've already alluded to a little bit, but the vasculature has anticoagulant properties. It has procoagulant properties, and then it has fibrinolytic properties. And I think one important thing is the, the uh, vocabulary. So when we say anticoagulant, fibrinolytic, or procoagulant, we're not saying thrombotic, because thrombotic is typically more associated with disease processes, right, or abnormal. Procoagulant is the normal process that promotes coagulation. Right. Yep. Yeah, and I think these terms get a little uh, messy, especially since we've kind of co-opted uh, therapeutics to, to be anticoagulants. So I think when... You start talking like that, um, yeah, it can get a little confusing. When I really started to dig hard into the science, so like full disclosure, I was not a coag master when I graduated <laughs> with my MLS undergrad. But like subsequently, when I really dug through the theory, it was so fascinating to see the different, uh, I, I kind of call them push and pulls sort of between these systems uh, to, to be in an equilibrium state that is homeostasis, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we want the vasculature to promote coagulation, but when it's necessary, right? And then we want it to suppress coagulation when it's necessary. Yeah. <laughs> so it's all about the timing of these, these systems. And when you understand the normal physiology like this, when we get into pathophysiology, it becomes much more, more uh, intuitive, in my yes. opinion. Um, <laughs> For the record, I was not a coag guru when I graduated college either with my MLS. I did a, a lot of research and a lot of reading because I went straight into working in special coag. And so I, I read like every book I could get my hands on that was in the special coag lab. I read every single one. I bought more. I actually, this is how nerdy I was. I like rewrote all of the theory from our procedures and from textbooks. I actually have notebooks where I wrote sentences, like were notes and stuff from all those textbooks. So I'm super nerdy because I was super into it. That's why I, where I got my, my coag theory from. Yeah. I, oof, I had to force feed myself coag theory, <laughs> I think. but I, I really did enjoy it though. I did. I did. Um, so there's a lot to this, right. But um, how do we want to parse these? So, so let's just start with one. So let's just talk about what are some of the anticoagulant properties that the vasculature has. Yeah. So I think the first one I think of uh, is prostacyclin. Mm -hmm. um, so when we get into platelets, we're going to learn about a chemical called thromboxane. 
And I kind of look at this as like the antithesis to yeah. thromboxane. Is that appropriate? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so prostacycline's job is to keep platelets chill. Yeah. <laughs> is that accurate? Yeah, it's a platelet activator inhibitor. And so it comes from the acrosinoid synthesis pathway. Like Dave said, we'll talk more about it with platelets. But that pathway is either going to give you thromboxane or prostacycline. And prostacycline is typically made more in endothelial cells and thromboxane is typically made more in platelets. Mm -hmm. So prostacycline is one of the chemicals that can be synthesized from our endothelial cells to inhibit platelets from being activated. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm, I'm, it's going to be obvious we're going down a list. So <laughs> next up is nitric oxide, which has a lot of different functions besides, um, vasodilation. So how does vasodilation contribute to, uh, anticoagulant? Yeah. So, um, it's important for when we're talking about the, the, what's happening, right? Because you, when you have the an injury typically what you have is vasoconstriction because you're trying to restrict the flow of blood to that area so you're trying to prevent some of your coagulation factors from escaping and you're trying to keep things relegated to that site of injury hmm. whereas when you don't have an injury you want the the vasculature to be less constricted and you want the blood to be able to flow through more easily so vasodilation plays a role there mm -hmm. the other thing is nitric oxide can also inhibit platelets from aggregating and being activated so nitric oxide is playing a couple of roles there outside of the roles that it's going to play you know when we talk about vasodilation in regards to things like sickle cell disease so we'll talk about that as well once we eventually make it to hemoglobinopathies mm -hmm. yeah i think this is all this is a great point too right there's a sometimes you know nitric oxide has this anticoagulant property and there'll be one particular component that we focus on, right? right? And that might be the thing that you're taught. But, you know, nature rarely has a story that's straightforward. Right? <laughs> There's a lot of like complicated interactions usually that go on. So sometimes I might distill something down. You know, this is just kind of foreshadowing, right? But we might distill something down to a particular point. And it may be that that theoretical point is the most important. But there's usually a lot of... Um, really diff uh, difficult to, to explain interactions that are mm -hmm. going on. Um, all right, what's next on our list, Melissa? Heparan sulfate. Heparan, is that like heparin? <laughs> Similar, but it's heparan. So heparan sulfate is a natural anticoagulant that we have in small amounts in our body. Mm -hmm. So heparan sulfate. And that, that still interacts with uh, antithrombin and uh, not to go, go ahead. Is that, is that accurate? Is there... I bet, honestly, I've never looked into heparan sulfate. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Just a curious uh, uh, part of my brain. Um, next one, tissue factor pathway inhibitor. So um, we kind of foreshadow tissue factor and our fibroblasts that secrete uh, uh, this tissue factor is one of the uh, main components of initiating the extrinsic coat cascade. So normal intact endothelial cells secrete this pathway inhibitor. So uh, essentially um, trying to stop the extrinsic cascade from, from starting. Um, yeah. And we'll so talk more in depth about TFPI and how it functions when we get to you know, talking about the coag cascade and the natural inhibitors of the coag cascade. Yep, yep, yep. And then we have thrombomodulin. Thrombomodulin is a really cool uh, re receptor. Is it fair to call it a receptor? Yeah. Yep. Um, really neat receptor that has some uh, cool interactions. Um, but thrombomodulin will be the uh, principal protein to initiate uh, protein C's uh, anticoagulant effects. So <clears throat> protein, but I'm not, I'm, I was going to go on about protein C, but that's probably not wise. <laughs> not yet. No. So you, you need thrombo, you don't, I guess you don't need it, but you need it if you want protein C to be activated in enough amounts to really have its effect, its inhibitory effect. So pro, uh, excuse me, thrombomodulin with 
uh, endothelial cell protein C receptor. Those two are important receptors that'll play a really large role. And again, it's something that we'll talk about when we get to inhibiting the coag cascade. Okay. All right. So um, end of list. Yeah. So um, those are lots of uh, um, chemical uh, means for anticoagulant. And then I would just, we talked about the smooth blood flow also being a sort of anticoagulant, right? So, um, so now procoagulant activity from the vasculature. Yeah. Um, and the top line here, top line item here talks about vasoconstriction. So we talked about that physiology a little bit, right? So yes. if I have damage to the endothelial cells, I want to restrict blood flow to lower the shear forces, right? And to give time for that primary platelet plug and subsequent um, clot formation. <sighs> Collagen exposure. I'm just going to I just cut me off, right? <laughs> <laughs> so if we imagine the layers of our endothelial cells and we have collagen below that, if I have some kind of injury, right, the endothelial cells been displaced and now I have exposed collagen. So exposed collagen is a procoagulant uh, when it, especially when it interacts with platelet receptors. So there's a couple of platelet receptors that will attach to collagen and will cause platelets to activate and subsequently recruit their buddy platelets, right? What else we got, Melissa? Von Wilbrand's factor. Hey, one of my favorites. <laughs> she loves fun. Like way too much love for Von Wilbrand's factor. <laughs> I get really excited about it and I will tell you anything you never wanted to know about it if you let me talk about it long enough. So I'll try to keep it brief. But Von Willy is going to be a really important player. And we talk about primary hemostasis coming up because it really helps. Well, it plays a couple of roles, but in primary hemostasis, it's going to help bridge binding of platelets to that collagen that's exposed, which you'll hear us call a subendothelial collagen a lot because it's under the endothelium. So Von Willy is important for uh, promoting platelets binding to that collagen. So Von Willebrand's factor is synthesized and secreted from our endothelial cells. Keep it nice and brief. <laughs> yeah, we'll keep it there. Um, and then I, I'll, I, I might need your help a little bit here. Yeah. So secretion of adhesion molecules. What yeah. Kind of so molecules? In in addition to secreting out von Willebrand's factor, it'll secrete <laughs> out adhesion molecules that help to adhere von Willebrand's onto the endothelial cell surface once it's secreted. In other adhesion molecules that can help with other proteins adhering to the endothelial surface because you're going to excrete von Willebrand's. Endothelial cells don't really have receptors for binding von Willebrand's. So how do you keep von Willebrand's on the endothelial cell surface once you secrete it? Because you mm -hmm. kind of want it, you don't always, sometimes you want it to be secreted and go, you know, circulate, but sometimes you want it to be secreted and stay so that it can help. And so you have to have those adhesive molecules to help hold on to that von Willebrand's. And so it's going to help secrete adhesion molecules that can help bind onto von Willebrand's and platelets and other proteins that you need to keep bound or you want to keep them local. Right. Uh, yeah, and then finally here, we we already kind of started speaking about this, but tissue factor exposure. So once that endothelial cell um, layer has been disrupted, we're going to have a secretion of tissue factor. Mm -hmm. So this these are the parts that I think I like. I see the beauty of like nature and the physiology. The fact that an intact endothelial cell secretes tissue factor pathway inhibitor. And then when it's disrupted, when that layer is disrupted, we have the secretion of tissue factor. So you know, I see this on a couple of different levels, right? So these are obviously like, this is the most stark anticoagulant, procoagulant kind of um, uh, side to look at this. Um, but I also very much appreciate that this system keeps the clot localized, right? So um, you have a localized injury, you're secreting tissue factor, mm -hmm. and that tissue factor is going to move, right, with blood flow. Mm -hmm. And when it gets to an area that has intact endothelial cells, that tissue factor pathway inhibitor, there's a reason why we've evolved that that uh, that system, right? So yep. th this is the stuff that I just, I, I love. It's one of my favorite parts about this uh, discipline, I guess. So yeah, anyway, tissue factor. So <laughs> so what is it? Tissue factor and factor seven, something, something, clot formation, right? 
and we'll uh, we'll talk about that um, more in depth when we get to secondary hemostasis. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. So. Okay, so uh, we talked about anticoagulant. We talked about procoagulant. So now let's have a hypothetical situation where we have vascular injury and we have clot formation. So like what now, right? Um, we said that vasculature has fibrinolytic, fibrinolytic properties. So where do we start there, Melissa? Well, I think we should start with how Ooh. do you... Ooh, we got to talk about... Sorry. <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, so how do we talk? Uh, I mean, how do we start? So I guess the first thing is once you have the clot there, you have to start breaking it down. Yeah. So you need something to initiate that yeah. breakdown or activate the thing that's going to break it down. So the first thing that the vas the our endothelial cells are going to secrete is TPA or tissue plasminogen activator. And that's what's going to activate plasminogen into plasmin and plasmin will start breaking down the clot. So TPA is secreted to initiate clot breakdown. So let's put a, a let's tag this dog ear, this page, right? Because um, this also starts during clot formation. So the, there's a little bit more context here that kind of clicked when I started, <laughs> you started talking about it. So yeah, we'll talk about how plasminogen, um, where that comes from a little later. Okay. Yep. But this would be the initiator, right? This is uh, the detonator. I, I think of uh, plasminogen as like little sticks of dynamite that you stick in the clot. And then TPAs are like our ignition sort of. Um, plasminogen activator inhibitor. This Now we're starting to get into an alphabet soup that gets really kind of confusing to manage. Yeah. yeah. Um, so pi, yeah. pi one. Mm. So plasminogen activator inhibitor is actually secreted in larger amounts than TPA. And in part, that's to control TPA because you don't want TPA to escape. You definitely don't want it to escape from the area. So you really want to inhibit TPA. So PI inhibits TPA. Mm. And so that's secreted also from endothelial cells. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that can get a little confusing, right? Because like, well, hold on. It's preventing the breakdown of the clot, right? And I think the idea here is we need healing to happen first, right? Yeah. We don't want to just make a clot and then dissolve it right away. Yeah. There's actually a disorder where we make clots and dissolve them and make clots and <laughs> dissolve them. So um, so that's interesting. That's the, again, uh, uh, my, my um, push-pull kind of these two systems working with each other. And uh, this one is actually really neat too. Thrombin activatable fibrinolysis inhibitor. When mm -hmm. I first started to learn about this one, it was like, wait, what? Huh? Mm -hmm. So thrombin, we haven't learned about thrombin yet, yeah. but I think of thrombin as a procoagulant, right? Yeah. So what's thrombin's role? What, what is taffy and thrombin? thrombin has too many roles. So we'll probably talk about thrombin. <laughs> and that's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> but really um, taffy is going to be activated by thrombin to help yeah. inhibit <laughs> So it's it's great. We'll we'll talk a lot more about all of these. I don't I don't think we can go in depth into any of them right now because we yeah. haven't hit the coag cascade yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's tough. Yeah, it's true. Uh, so we'll we'll dog ear that one as yeah. well, right? Our we'll dog ear them. <laughs> um. Okay. So according to my list that I <laughs> in front of me, I think we kind of covered we did. vasculature. We did, especially from a laboratory. Uh, right. hemostasis kind of point of view right so yeah and that's the thing is we talk about the vasculature because it supports hemostasis obviously right it supports all of hematology but really the vasculature we don't have we don't measure it in the lab we don't have anything to do with it in the lab so we we talk about the normal vasculature properties because it's in support of hemostasis mm -hmm. but i think now that we've talked about the vasculature we can move over to really focusing on the rest of primary hemostasis, which is primarily platelets, and then of course supported by von Willebrand's factor. I'm scared now. This is the part where I get really scared. Platelets are so cool. I they are them. literally like one of the coolest cells that we have. I know people are like, no, when you look at like a diff and you get to see the immature glands or a plasma cell, like those are the cool ones, right? Visually, yes, but 
in theory, platelets are so cool because they are these little e-nucleate fragments that look like, right? You don't think anything exciting about these platelets, but then they come at you and they're like, well, I've got a million receptors and I've got all these connected weird pathways and I've got all this really complicated stuff, even though they look like nothing. Yeah. I, I certainly like, you know, we have, we, we start teaching in the, in the program that we're, in, that we graduated from, right. We start with him pretty early. So, mo and most of that interaction is looking at normal peripheral yeah. blood. And, um, it's a fun way to kind of dive into it, but yeah, I would like, if you ask a first year student about playlists, they just don't, they don't care. Like whatever, little purple dots and blue cytoplasm, whatever. Um, they probably don't even notice that much detail. Uh, <laughs> but they are fascinating little machines and um, I think their uh, morphological simplicity doesn't do justice what goes on in there and yeah um, so I the, the coag was probably the most fun I had studying for my SH yeah. and the platelets was like a huge eye-opener I, I read that chapter on platelets so many times I loved it yeah and even so what we're reviewing for theory on these podcasts are really focused on MLT MLS content. So laboratory scientists, either in the two year or four year degree. And really the difference is that four year degree just has to know more for the certification exam. So we might go into a little bit more depth than an MLT might need to know, but you know, that's okay. I think knowing more or reviewing more is better than reviewing less. What they need to know we're not going to go in crazy depth because platelets have been implicated in, you know, issues with cancer and in the immune system. And there's a lot more to platelets, especially that you can find in research. We're not going to dive deep into that because that's not necessary to know for the certification exams. Is it really cool and interesting? Yes. But we're reviewing more that MLT MLS level of our theory. So you know, you might read really cool articles that go really in depth. And, and even some of the normal biochemical pathways for platelets, we're not going to go super in depth on because again, they're beyond the MLT MLS content. Yeah. But yeah, so let's dive into platelets then. Yeah. So we can't have a platelet without a megakaryose. Mega <laughs> yeah. So it's easy to kind of forget about, um, those uh given that you don't see them in the peripheral circulation right so um i mean i can count probably on my two hands how many times i've seen megakaryocytes like um fragments yes yeah but yeah well i'm thinking like even in bone marrows right like where oh, i don't yeah. look at bone marrows very often i i just you just don't even really look at them um yeah. but so megakaryopoiesis yes so let's talk about just briefly on that word poesis means the development of and megakaryo is the megakaryocyte so megakaryopoesis is the development of megakaryocytes thrombopoesis is the development of your platelets yeah. so you start with megakaryopoesis and then develop into thrombopoesis mm -hmm. yeah so um these the megakaryocytes themselves uh morphologically in um uh, maturation cycle wise we separate them into three categories we start with a blast which makes sense this follows kind of uh patterns of other um uh poetic hematopoietic kind of uh, cell lines we end up with a pro megakaryocyte this is really comfortable to me right like we go into pro and finally we end up on a megakaryocyte i have seen them throw around like mk1 mk2 mk3 the synonymous. It's all using the same system. It's just a different uh, nomenclature. Yeah. And I've seen um, some of the textbooks that you'll read. This is really going into the weeds, though. We'll talk about four and um, three, four different developmental levels, but yeah. it, it's just kind of getting into the weeds of when things are developing. So most textbooks do describe three MK1, MK2, MK3 rather than the four, but some will describe four. So just putting that out there. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, so if we look at other hematopoietic development, they usually stimulated by cytokines, right? Some kind of chemical signaling um, to, you know, tell cells to mm -hmm. terminally differentiate somewhere, right? So 
You know where I'm going, right? I do. <laughs> Mega karyocytes are no different. Yes, right. So we had what was, what was it? Erythropoietin uh, for our red cells. Yeah. What what about for our megakaryocytes? Well, it's going to be surprising, but it's thrombopoietin. <laughs> so you know, it. It, it's a hormone that stimulates platelet production. Thrombopoietin. Yep. <clears throat> so uh, thrombopoietin is synthesized in the liver. I think that's an important differentiator because Dave, you mentioned erythropoietin and that comes from our kidneys. Right. And I think the way that students should remember is that basically everything in coag comes from your liver. Yeah, that, <laughs> so, that's a good way to organize it. Yeah, isn't it? Mm -hmm. it's not surprising that thrombopoietin would also come from the liver. Right, yep, 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 yep. Um, and I, I think the other thing that's important to emphasize there is just like erythropoietin, the level of thrombopoietin is going to be inversely proportional to your platelet mass, your platelet and your megakaryocyte mass. So the more platelets and megakaryocytes you have, the less thrombopoietin you have and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And that's a good system, right? That's yep. <laughs> all things balance, they say. Yep. Um, <clears throat> so our megakaryoblasts, um, we won't really talk much about morphological right. characteristics of megakaryocytes. I honestly, you wouldn't want me to, to be totally well, honest. It's a blast, right? A blast, yeah. like we always say in lab, a blast is a blast is a blast. So morphologically, a, a megakaryoblast is going to look like any other blast. Yeah, yeah. It's just once it starts developing pro megakaryocyte, megakaryocyte gets bigger and it gets more typical looking for a, a mega karyocyte. And, and we'll talk about bone marrow is at another point. So we'll talk yeah. more about. We'll get someone smarter too, right? That, well, no. we'll get somebody who actually <laughs> looks at bone marrows, which is not us. We don't look at bone marrows. I mean, I can tell you what a mega karyocyte looks like, but I don't have a whole lot of experience looking at bone marrows. <clears throat> so in our mega karyoblast phase, we have some important physiology taking place there, right? So, okay. um, there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot of, what's the name? Is it acronyms? There's a lot of these, um, uh, uh, the DMS system, right? Mm. So we're talking about DMS and um, yep. there's so many of these in color. There are, yeah, there are. It, it is a nightmare to kind of keep these straight. But um, the demarcation Ooh. system, right? Yeah. That's what our DMS stands for. And uh, I actually tried to like look up the words. So a lot of times, and I want to send this out to the listeners. If you're reading like a scientific journal or a scientific textbook or something, and you come across words, dig into them a little bit more. Because when I started like reading about demarcations, it started pointing to territorial lines drawn on maps. What the heck does that have to do with platelets? So um, the demarcation system that starts forming in our megakaryoblasts is essentially setting up what will eventually be the individual platelets. Is that accurate, Melissa? Does that sound? Yeah, yeah exactly. It's basically the megakaryocyte outlining the cytoplasm for protoplatelet development. So really, really neat. And, and uh, protoplatelet development, we'll talk about that, that yeah. part a little bit more. So this is happening very, very early on in a megakaryocyte uh, formation. So it's really neat. So our DMS system uh, the demarcation system is strictly to just cordon off the different parts of the cytoplasm that will eventually become platelets. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, and this term too. So a lot of these terms, they sound like other terms. Endomitosis. Endomitosis. So endo, I think in like in, yeah. right? Is that... And then mitotic. So when I think of mitosis, I think of making new nuclei, right? Um, PMAT so, and C. What's that? With the phases of endomitosis. PMAT and C. Sure. I guess I need to brush up my biology. Prophase, <laughs> metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and cytokinesis. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so obviously, I didn't pay attention too much. And uh, not like I know these things, and then I might discard them and then reacquire yeah. them as convenient. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's uh, uh, there's no telophase, so there's no actual uh, making of a new cell, making new nuclei, but not a new cell. And this speaks to what a megakaryocyte will look like, right? Terminally, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself there. Um, so should I slow down? No, or... it's because the endomitosis starts in the blast phase, but really it's not complete until the megakaryocyte phase. Right. But it starts here. Right. 
<clears throat> so and so it's important that when you have one megakaryo blast, you get one megakaryo site. Right. Yep. Which is unusual in yes. the hematopoietic, right? Yep. So normally one, um, you know, uh, it will make so many daughter cells from it. Uh, this is not the case with this. So all that energy is going to be put to making new nuclei, but for the same cell. Yes. Yeah. Um, so bu 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 bu, pro megakaryocyte, I see in my notes, we're continuing our endomitosis. So we're making more and more nuclei. Yep. Um, but, and you're getting larger and yes. you're really starting to, so you're starting to synthesize some contents now really for your granules that you're going to throw into them, the, the contents that you are synthesizing. And then you're really going to start developing that cell, right? Really, really outlining the demarcation system more prominently at this point. Mm -hmm. Yep. So further development of those systems. Um, and then finally, we end up on our megakaryocyte. Um, these cells are quite large. So um, the term like mega, right? So it's a prefix owing to the millions, right? So you can kind of like, whoa, mega, this is a huge cell with tons of nucleus, uh, nuclei in them. Um, yeah, you it's can... usually the largest cell in the bone marrow too. So yeah. when you are looking at a bone marrow, you will see the megakaryocytes easily, even on low power. And we'll have to ask a more experienced person, but I think they even do uh, morphology on like lower powers, right? Where you, you wouldn't even think of doing white cell morphology or red cell morphology stuff on less than 100x, right? But mm -hmm. it's pretty routine with the megakaryocytes because it's so large. <clears throat> yeah, so, and then I have in my notes here that they can have 32 to 64 <laughs> nuclei. Yep. That's insane. Yep. So what's the advantage to having so many nuclei? Like, what, why do they need so many nuclei? It's a good question. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, I don't know the actual answer to that. Mm -hmm. I don't know that anybody has actually looked into that. Yeah. To but me, it's like it's like more opportunity to, to transcribe, translate, right? More opportunity. Yes. So I, I think because they're so large and because they have to make so much for their cells, and they have so many so many things going on, right? The demarcation system, endomitosis. We haven't even started talking about the rest of the things that it needs to do for the cell and the structure. Mm -hmm. So I think between all of that and, of course, with trying to create all of the things that they need for their granular contents, I think it's advantageous to have more nuclei, to have more things going on. Yep, yep. So we don't know, but that's what we think. Yes. <laughs> our best educated guess yes so sometimes you just have like these intuitive senses and they can be yes. wrong and they can be right but yep. um all right so uh do is there anything else we should talk about in mega or no yeah i don't think so i think we're good okay so you had alluded to thrombopoiesis right mm -hmm. so that's our next our next phase so thrombopoiesis is the uh, is uh, making the actual individual platelets, those anucleate cell fragments that we'll see in our peripheral blood circulation. So how does this process kind of shake out? How does it, what does it do? Yeah, so it's called protoplatelet formation first because you're making protoplatelets. Mm -hmm. Think of prototype, right? You're, you're creating like that initial thing that's going to become something. So you, you have protoplatelet formation. And this is usually happening somewhere along an edge where a megakaryocyte can kind of stick a piece of its cytoplasm out into either a vein or an artery or somewhere out where it's getting into the circulation and not just happening, you know, randomly in the bone marrow. It probably happens occasionally randomly in the bone marrow, but I imagine that the megakaryocyte really wants to stick its little protoplatelet formation or its little pseudopod out into the vasculature. So it's going to basically break off a piece of its cytoplasm the way that it's outlined in the demarcation system mm -hmm. and it's going to kind of weave its little protoplatelet formation out into that vasculature and then essentially what happens is you have little rounding or like separation starting to form in that pseudopod where your protoplatelets are forming and then little pieces are just going to start breaking off of the cytoplasm and they're going to be tiny fragments that are enucleate and contain granules and some other pieces that platelets will need to function 
but it's not going to have a nucleus and it's going to be teeny tiny. And what they're what two to four micrometers in size. So they're, they're very, very small as they're breaking off. So that little pseudopod is the protoplatelet formation. And then you get platelets popping off of that. I kind of like uh, my mind thinks of like a drive through mm. <laughs> and it just like handing platelets like out of the window into the yeah. vasculature. Um, yeah. So uh, important to note that these little, pl these platelets have everything they need for their platelet journey at this point, right? So the megakaryocytes yeah. synthesize all that for them. Yeah, um, we'll talk about endocytosis. And so platelets are gonna kind of grab onto some other things that they'll need as they're circulating. But really the the, the process of the protoplatelet formation, platelets have almost everything that they need or they have all the processes to get the things that they're lacking mm -hmm. that they need for the rest of their lifespan. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right, so uh, so we have platelets. Um, yeah, and so they're resting little enucleate platelets, and you know they're gonna go out into the world. What shape are they, Melissa? Yeah, so they're kind of a, a roundish ovoid shape. They're not perfectly round, but they're ovoid in shape. They're enucleate. They're and remember, keep in mind these are three D structures like the rest of our cells. So it's kind of. Uh, like um, I, I always think about those cloth frisbees. I don't know if you re remember those that I used to play with when I was a kid. Not the plastic frisbees, but the cloth ones, because they're not huge, right? They're not going to be round in that respect, but they're kind of ovoid in shape. But then they have this kind of little thickness to them, almost like the size of I, I'd compare, I guess, to a donut, where they mm -hmm. would have kind of like that, you know, some meat to them, but not quite big puffy and round so that's what i usually think of for platelets those little cloth frisbees yep. um their lifespan is about 10 days yeah which is not very long right so i think this is another thing that um and uh, so that life process too feeds into like when we talk about acute leukemias and uh this myelothecific uh anemia that develops um, you have the thrombocytopenia uh, as like a hallmark of a lot of these acute, acute leukemias. That's one of the first things that will kind of develop, right? Because if I don't have any healthy megakaryocytes to make my platelets, um, you have a, uh, a thrombocytopenia that'll develop um, precipitously, right? Quickly. Uh, yeah. Anyway. So yeah, they don't live particularly long. Um normal quantities right so i always have in my head like 150 um uh as my low 450 on the high side um and i mean thousands per microliter uh it depends on the units you choose to use yeah and that number reference intervals can vary slightly depending Absolutely. on where you work the institutions will vary but either way it'll be about 150 to 450 Right. And like, I think that there's some of the nuance here too, right? Is like, you know, if a platelet's 400, like when I see numbers like that, that's like high normal. And like, just because something is 1000 platelet outside of the range, right? Yeah. Uh, so um, the, the, I, I know for us, right. And when we work clinically, those ranges, the upper and lower end have some. Um, yes, okay. absolutely. Yeah. Right? Cause and, like, let's say 150 to 450 451 yeah that, yeah, <laughs> yeah like we wouldn't even blink at, at that right yeah. you know you're gonna be like oh that's within like testing variation ability you know we don't really care about 451 but you know 700 yeah yeah and you're like okay all right now let's think about and it and that's where it's funny i think some of these ranges i have like solid numbers but a lot of the uh if cbc into c numbers are just like there's like uh there's just a feeling that kind of goes along with them i don't know about you but um yeah my spidey sense will tingle yep uh, but, 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 but what else would you want to talk about our our resting platelet Thank so you. actually let's, let's go, go back to the normal reference range sure. that really only covers two-thirds of our circulating platelets yes 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 because yep. the other one third is being sequestered in the spleen. Mm. So the spleen is um, 
I think by hematologists is well regarded, right? It's our organ, I think. <laughs> for multiple reasons. Yeah, for so many different reasons. It has so much functionality and use to it. And this is one of them, right? Is to kind of be a uh, storage pool of sorts um, uh, so that the platelets are available. Uh, but, and, you know, you don't want to have too many platelets in circulation, right, Melissa? That can get bad. Why was, what would happen with too many platelets in circulation? Too many platelets, you're going to have an increased concentration. They're going to start touching things, touching each other. And when platelets touch things, they become activated. And we don't <laughs> want platelets to become activated. So we don't want them touching things or each other. No activation. So this is a wonderful evolu evolutionary system where I can have a, a reserve, right? Maybe that's a good term, of platelets that are ready to, to deploy in stressful situations, uh, injury and such. Um, yeah. So for example, like if you injure yourself, if you have inflammation, if you have an infection, your spleen will release those circulating platelets, which is one of the things when you have uh, any sort of inflammation, your, your platelet count will increase. And that's because you're releasing the reserves, you're releasing those one third of platelets from the spleen to go out. And so it's, a, it's one of our positive acute phase reactants because it's increased during inflammation really neat another beautiful part of our physiology and nature um hylomere granulomere yeah so i remember <laughs> it's like studying i'm like what <laughs> this is more of a morphological kind of a uh, system right so i think um next time you all look at platelets look close okay and you'll notice um what we i i guess i'd say would be the hylomere right the 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 cytoplasm is that blue um, kind of area. And then you'll have this dense kind of area of granulation that would be our granulomere, right? Yeah. Is that accurate? Yep, that's basically it. Um, oh, geez. Um, so the plasma membrane of the platelet, such an important part yeah. of this piece, uh, phospholipids. So early on in our education, in physiology, we learned about are the way animal membranes are composed, right? Mm -hmm. So we have uh, phospholipids, uh, what is it? Polar heads, nonpolar tails, right? So mm -hmm. we wanna tap into that. So um, when I'm first learning about this, I'm looking and I'm like, oh, phospholipids, a phospholipids, a phospholipid, right? Wrong. <laughs> so there's some asymmetry here, isn't there, Melissa? Yeah. So yeah. the certain phospholipids we like to express internally and the certain phospholipids we like to express externally. Yeah, and externally we mean towards the extracellular matrix outside of the cell and internally we mean in towards the cytoplasm of the cell. Yep, yep. And so um, and so essentially this breaks down to neutral and polar uh, mm -hmm. kind of classes. We could divvy up these phospholipids. Yeah. Um, the, the phospholipid I always think of that's so consequential with platelets is phosphatidylserine. Yes. Um, is that like a good place to kind of start? Mm -hmm. Um, so this, this, pla this phospholipid is facing internally into, is that accurate? Yeah. So, um, what's significant about it facing internally and like what kind of things happen when it's not, when it's facing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it usually faces internally because it's the polar phospholipid, right? When you think of a phospholipid, you think, well, it's got a polar and more of a neutral end. But in general, the charges balance out in our neutral phospholipids. But with phosphatidylserine, it has an extra charge to it. And so when you expose it to the extracellular matrix, you're exposing a charge, so what happens when you have a charge? Well, you attract the opposite charge. So when you attract the opposite charge, you're making platelets stick to things. Mm -hmm. That might be a good thing if it's the normal yeah. process, but if it's an abnormal process, if you're abnormally exposing your polar phospholipids, then you can abnormally stick onto endothelial cells, other platelets, mm -hmm. other proteins, other cells, other things you shouldn't be sticking to. Yeah. So we want that that polar phospholipid to face internally until we want it exposed. Yes. Yep. Cool. And 
it, it's this is typical for all of ourselves, right? Because we they all have that same trilaminar structure that we're, we're used to seeing for our mammalian cells. So this is not unique to platelets. Yep, yep. Platelets are just so good at sticking, right? Yes. Yeah. And so it's just, it's a little bit more important that we have that polar phospholipid facing inside. It's a good point though, right? Because I mean, we're going to have red cells that express phosphatidylserine outside yep. and that's bad. That's bad for business, right? That's going to cause splenic macrophages to say, eh, eh, eh. <laughs> and, um, and is one of the uh, components to the pathophysiology of sickle cell disease, yeah. right? Is the... Um, the inability to maintain um, uh, the phospholipid internally. And once it's external, sticky, vaso occlusion, blah, bad stuff, right? So phosphatidylserine, I think if there's one phospholipid we're t- that we want to focus on, I think that's the one that I kind of internally um, used. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And then it's a typical lim- trilaminar structure. So you have cholesterol in there as well. Yep, yep, yep. So cholesterol, a component of our uh, plasma membranes. Um, yeah. Um, mm. So the uh, the platelet surface mm-hmm. has a very special name. Tell me if I'm pronouncing this correctly. The glycocalyx? Yeah. All right. Woo! <laughs> so I, I think the other thing too is all of our hematopoietic cells will have a glycocalyx it's just the platelets is significantly larger mm-hmm. mm. so it's a it's a thick right you kind of think of it as like a, a like a shell almost right yeah. um and so um this is going to facilitate several different uh important physiological functions so the main thing is to maintain a negative charge, right? So maintaining a negative charge, if platelet A is negatively charged outside and platelet B, its brother, is negatively charged outside, what does that mean physiologically? You're going to repel one another. This is awesome, right? So these same charges are going to push each other away. Very advantageous to normal blood circulation that yeah. these cells repel one another. Yes. Um, we also see this in other cells too, right? Again, so, but it, it's just the importance of platelets. When two platelets get together, you know, we want to, um, we want those interactions to be appropriate and timely and not just spontaneous. Yep. Um, and then uh, it also facilitates, we talked about endocytosis. Don't so confuse talk- it with endomitosis. It's in, which is extremely easy, isn't yeah. it? So, The key there is the root words of mitosis and cytosis, right? Um, So uh, for endocytosis, we're thinking about our platelets. Um, I almost said phagocytizing. It's not phagocytizing. Uh, They're vacuuming up external components, right? So what kind of things do they pick up? um, Calcium is one of them or... Not usually calcium. So they're they're picking up proteins. Proteins. So maybe they're picking up uh, coagulation factor five or fibrinogen or other types of proteins like that, that can contribute to coagulation. They can pick them up from the environment, the extracellular matrix and pull it in to the cell and stick it into those alpha granules to store it until it actually needs it. Which is so neat, right? So most of our cells, I would say, synthesize the things they need for their primary function. It's incredibly unique to see platelets kind of doing this, uh, so yeah, so it. so the megakaryocyte did synthesize some things yeah. that the platelet will need, but not all. And so then we have endocytosis for that also. Really, really cool. Yeah, so endocytosis. Um, Endo is inside and cytosis the cell. So you're pulling things inside of the cell. And again, see, this is key. Break the words down into constituent pieces to make it make sense. And, okay. and you know, be be heavy handed with looking words up. And um, it's, I, it's just incredibly helpful to me personally. So, all right. Um, bu- 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 anything else to know about the the surface of our platelet? No, I think we can kind of bridge over to with endocytosis. Yes. Uh, once we pull it into the glycocalyx, how do we actually pull it into the cell? <laughs> so this is another really fun one to say. <laughs> so the SCCS. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> all right. Let's see if I flub this. The surface connected canicular system. Yeah. Yay. Yeah. And sometimes it's called the open canicular system. So the OCS. 
<laughs> oh geez. Yeah, but it's it's basically the the canicular system, right? So think of it in that way. I see the word canal in there. Yeah. Right. So what? Uh, so humans have gotten really good at building canals. So we dig like a trench or something to route water to farms and crops and stuff like that. Oh, uh, that's what's happening here, right? I mean, yeah. These are the dug trenches, the 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 tubes that are going to carry the endocytized uh, proteins in, right? Correct. To the alpha granules. To our alpha granules. Stick them in the alpha granules and they'll be stored there. And then once we're ready to secrete them. Oh, this is, was this the DTS now? No, we're, we're still going <laughs> to use that same system. Fair enough. We use that's, the same, so you have that the... same system for endocytosis or alpha granule secretion. It's just, when we'll talk about platelet activation, this SCCS just kind of goes from being nice long system to boop. A little bit shorter once you activate a platelet but it's the same exact surface connected canicular system that you use to either pull in things or get rid of things for your alpha granules so i was confusing slash jumping to the next system right <laughs> so the dense tubular system the dts yeah. this is the uh the, like command center kind of the platelet is that like a, a weird way to describe it or for when you're trying to activate a platelet Right. Okay. Okay. So, and so the DTS houses several things. Yep. The, you know, there's calcium. Yep. And then there's things like phospholipase A2 and calcium yep. and cyclooxygenase and calcium. But uh, is there calcium? Is, there's calcium. <laughs> yeah. So, there, this, the importance of the calcium here is that, and I emphasize the calcium because your dense granules also have calcium but one is going to excrete or, or secrete the calcium internally to promote activation and one is going to excrete the calcium external to the cell to promote coagulation so the dts is going to really push out the calcium to promote activation of the platelet internally yep so that's the, the important distinctions there right um and uh, both critical to the process um so yeah so the the dts um uh dts and calcium i think that's what i gather right if i were in your class listening to you that's what i want to calcium <laughs> that's what i kind of want to understand yeah um so we're at the dts um we're at um well, I guess we should still continue with the cytoskeletal stuff. I really want to get to activation now that we talked about the, the, the DTS. I, that's probably going to be the next podcast. I don't think we're going to have time in this one. Yeah, there's a good run out of time. So let's just uh, finish talking about like the general structure of a resting platelet. Okay. And and so other things that are really, really important to... Uh, so I always go back to red cells. I'm kind of a red cell guy, right? So um, they have uh, cytoskeletal... Uh, component to maintain their structure and shape and they also have um these um uh, I, I think of like actin i think of these contractile proteins right to be able to uh conform that's equally true with our platelets isn't it maybe even more so true it's true for all of our you know our white cells our red cells our, our platelets that's how they're going to move so they have microtubules actin microfilaments yeah. all of those things help with keeping the shape of the cell, extending any pseudopods that they have. And if they have to contract for any reason that it's going to help, it basically helps with maintaining shape and changing shape. Mm -hmm. And so like Dave said, it's important for platelets because they maintain the normal shape of a resting platelet, but they're going to be really important for shape change once we activate the platelet. Right. And shape change is just such a key component of, uh, of, of platelets. Right. Um, so what happened? What do they look like when they change shape? What happens when they? Yeah, so they go from those discoid shapes to basically they contract, right? So they pull in some of their cytoplasm and then they put out their little pseudopods. Yeah, so I like to do this little pseudopod dance. Like they, <laughs> if you're watching on YouTube, you can see me do the pseudopod dance. But basically, you're sticking out the pseudopods and you're kind of contracting the rest of that cytoplasm to increase surface area. Yep. Yep. And we'll, we'll talk gotta... more about that when we talk about activating platelets. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, ba, 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 ba. So um, other important internal components, I'm moving down my list here. We're going to the granules. So the things that are, are 
functional kind of storage compartments for really important constituent molecules, right? So um, the first one I have here is our dense granules. Um, two to seven per platelet. That's not that many, right? Um, kind of a, a small amount. And the other thing is you don't see them when you're right. looking in light microscopy. So when you're looking just in your compound microscope or looking at platelets, we see kind of this bluish gray color cytoplasm that's relatively clear outside of those purple granules. So the purple granules, not dense granules. No. Dense granules, we can't see. We need really a, a scanning electron microscope in order to be able to see them. And I think that kind of makes sense to me. You know, I, I didn't think about it this way, but when I look at a platelet and I see the purple dots, there's a lot of purple dots. <laughs> so if the dense granules represent two to seven per platelet, that that makes sense. That yep. that makes sense to me. Um, so really important contents in here. I'm seeing calcium, uh, calcium. and magnesium. Yep. So calcium. Uh, you alluded to will be important for secondary hemostasis. Yes. Uh, very good. Um, serotonin. Serotonin. What's the physiological function of serotonin in this context? I actually yeah. don't even have that. Oh, I was just going to say, I don't remember. Tell me. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I, I don't remember. Something about it tells me um, it might have uh, like a vasoconstrictive. I don't know. I, I was. Th it has to do with vaso, the either constriction or dilation. Okay. And interesting. If, if we're activating a platelet, it would probably have to do with constriction. Right. So that, see, this is where like, I do pretty good on tests because I'm like, I think it has to be construction. <laughs> yeah. um, but the the two that I, I think are most important to focus on here, ATP, ADP. Uh, so adenosine diphosphate and triphosphate. Yeah, well, I think ADP and calcium are probably the, the, the real, the ones, right? Yeah. So um, ADP, um, we'll talk about platelet receptors maybe later, right? Um, uh, ADP uh, uh, platelets have a constituent receptor for activation through ADP. I don't know why that was so hard for me. It's to an say. important agonist. Yes, an important agonist. So yeah. what is an agonist, Melissa? Something that can activate a platelet. Awesome. Okay. So cool. ADP so, is, a, is an important one that can activate platelets. Interesting. So it would seem the dense granule is going to promote secondary hemostasis and maybe even recruit more platelets. Yeah. The other thing that's important about the dense granules is that the contents are usually made from the megakaryocyte. So things that are endocytosed usually end up in the alpha granules and not the dense. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Yeah. All right. So, uh, yeah. So alpha granules. So I guess now this is our transition here. So there's a ton of stuff in here. There's, there's a ton. <laughs> there's way too much, Melissa. There's too Great. much stuff. Tell platelets yeah. to put less stuff in there. <laughs> Make my test well, easier. Some of them are endocytosed and some of them are made from the megakaryocyte. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so, yeah. I think one of the most important contents of a platelet is von Willebrand's factor. You so, would think that. I would think that. <laughs> I'm just teasing. So von Willi, we talked about earlier and how it's made in endothelial cells. It's, it's also made in megakaryocytes. Um, when we talk about Von Willi, I'll talk about the difference, the slight difference between the two, because, you know, I'm excited about it. But, you know, for, in general, it contains Von Willi, which is important because that's going to play a big role. It'll also contain other coagulation related items, though. Yep. Uh, but, 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 but what do we have? Fibr fibrinogen. Yep. Fibrinogen. Is important? Yeah. It's a very important factor five. Uh Things like that that play a role in secondary hemostasis, it'll secrete or have some of those that it can release. And then it'll have things like adhesive proteins, like fiber, uh, fibronectin. And then there's some membrane bound ones as well that it can express once it releases the granule contents. Like one of those adhesive molecules, like we talked about earlier, like P selectin. Yep. Cool. And of course, we talked about alpha granules. You pull stuff endocytosis, you pull stuff in and you stick them into the alpha granules. So you employ the surface connected canicular system. And then when you're excreting, you're also employing that same system. Really neat. Yeah. And then there's 50 to 80 per platelet. Which is a lot, right? And and so next time we look at a platelet, everybody, look at all those purple individual purple granules. Be careful. You can see your alpha granules. And so if I had right? Hypothetical, if I had a patient that had an alpha granule deficiency, right? What, 
Would that be, would they just look like gray platelets? Yep, gray blobs. <laughs> really cool. So an important part of, if I tie into differential discussions, if you see platelets and they don't have granules, that's an important thing. You should say that. It may be that they're agranular because it was a bad draw and they got activated prematurely, right? But it's important to note things like that. Um, well, if it's a bad draw, you're also going to see either platelets clumping or fibrin strands. You're not fibrin just strands. going to see agranular platelets. Good point. Very good point. So it's about context. Yes. Um, well, I think we should stop here for this one because then we can tie von Willebrand's factor into platelet activation and the platelet receptors in the next one. I trust your judgment 100%. <laughs> Sounds good. That was fun. That was fun. I enjoyed it. I mean, anytime I get to talk about coag. I'm I was terrified. So if I'm being honest with the audience here, I was terrified to talk about coag without uh, extensive preparation, but it was, but it was a good, it was a good little journey. Yeah, it was fun. So I think that's all we have for this one. See you on the next one. Well, if you're interested and you enjoy this content. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, uh, you know, if um, uh, if you enjoyed this, please uh, subscribe um, and uh, check us out on social media. Send us messages. We'd love to hear from everybody, um, you know, areas that we could focus on, do better. Uh, we, we're open to... Uh, um input yeah but. absolutely so <laughs> thanks for listening thanks for your time please like subscribe and hit the bell if you'd like notifications whenever we post a new video and feel free to reach out to us on social media or via email with comments or suggestions about future content thanks